Welcome back to the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, TW. And of course, with me, we got the number one man at the Impact Lounge, BQ. Ladies and gentlemen, say what's up to the people. Hey, what's up? Yeah, that, that was pretty simple. I was expecting all that mixologist and you know, all, all that all going that. You're, on. You're all of that. You're all of that. You're the, you're, the, you're the lease owner. You're the, you know, the, the bartender, the bar back, the bottle girl, the uh the security you do it all you do it all <laughs> hell yeah the landlord the just, uh-huh. just whatever whatever the, the hookah mouse so. the hookah 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 master here uh-huh. we go Ooh, i like that that's different that's different the hookah the hookah uh-huh. king that's right um, <laughs> um so yeah real quick before we get started ladies and gentlemen go ahead and you do a couple things for us real quick Hit the like button so that everybody knows that you watched and liked this video. Um, hit that subscribe button so that you are subscribed to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you get notified each and every time we drop some brand new fire content on this page. And of course, there's going to be plenty of fire content on this page. All right. Um, I think you should plug your YouTube channel that you oh, just started. Yeah, well. Now that you mention it, um, if you guys enjoy these conversations that we do, um, I do, you know, uh, uh, another podcast where I talk about, you know, some other things, some AEW things, talk about some impact things, talk about some entertainment, sports, music things, you know, just whatever is on my mind. Um, it's the Talking About Podcast. That's T-A-L-K-I-N-B-O-U-T podcast. And if you just search that on YouTube, you can find my channel. Please, please, please do your boy a favor. Go uh, subscribe to that channel and drop a few comments in, uh, in the, in the videos. I get back to all the comments as many as I can. And, you know, listen, I appreciate each and every interaction that I get with you guys. There's a new pod coming up in, uh, in, in a couple of days, going to cover, you know, a lot of things that we, we, we don't cover here, a lot of outside of impact stuff. Um, but again, just search talking about pod, uh, in your YouTube, uh, in your YouTube search bar and pull up the talking about podcast and uh, yeah, like I said, go subscribe to it, and uh, I'm gonna deliver you more good fire content over there. All right. So if you if you if you like what we do over here, then you know you'll like. Uh, by the way, I, BQ, I gotta get you over on on the other podcast, man. You know what I mean? We gotta you know talk about some outside of impact stuff. I would love to, dude. I, I haven't had that opportunity to like just. I, I've been just been doing this impact thing for so long. Like sometimes I just want to give my I, my thoughts on AEW or NXT or whatever. You know, just to do something different you know i want to so. talk to you about voting rights in illinois no, I'm joking. <laughs> oh yeah there we go <laughs> price of gas yeah yeah the housing taxes you know. damn you joe biden no, <laughs> <laughs> um but we are here obviously to talk about impact wrestling and listen impact had a strong episode this week i was a big fan especially the the, to, the stuff towards the end. Man, Impact came back strong this week. But before we get into the episode, and by the way, stick around, because after we review the episode, we're going to do something fun. Impact has their year-end awards episode coming up this Thursday. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually go through the categories, and we're going to make the case for why we think some people should win. It's not necessarily who we think is going to win. We're just going to make the case. We're going to do it like a lawyer. Like, I, I, I talk a lot. So people used to tell me that I would have been good at being a lawyer, okay? I thought I would have been good at being a lawyer. But then I got rejected by a bunch of law schools. That's neither here nor there. That's neither here. I'm not bitter. I'm not mad. I'm not mad, okay? I'm not mad. I work at a gas station. I make a great living, okay? But, uh, you know, I'm just saying. What? <laughs> <laughs> you do not. I'm just kidding, but uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. So we're gonna that we're gonna do that later in the show. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So please make sure you stick around. And make sure you drop your comments. You know, uh, in as we're talking about anything, if we say something you think is crazy, just go ahead and drop your comment down below. And um, and maybe next week or the week after, we're gonna get back to a bunch of a bunch of comments. Um, so before we get into the show, BQ, what outside of the show, the the this week's episode of Impact what has been on your mind well we're going to talk talk viewership here mm-hmm. now you mentioned that this was a good show this really was and we uh, we mentioned before like last week's episode wasn't good uh, i just mm-hmm. thought that the matches 
I, I just didn't think it was good. Like I didn't enjoy, I didn't enjoy like I had the previous few episodes that they did. There were some good segments and everything, but for the most part, you know, as I said last week, it was just super formulaic. Like, hey, this is our, our good match spot. This is our we own the night spot. This is our, yeah. uh, you know, bullshit match spot. Our other bullshit match spot. Our sneak attack backstage. Like it was just so just you know, dancing by the, by the numbers. And, um, this was a big bounce back episode. This was really good, but you know, did last week's show. And of course there's gonna be people who liked last week's show, but did last week's show make it where, you know, people were like, well, okay, this show's boring. This wasn't a good show, whatever. Do I give a shit what's on next week? You promote a contract signing, which is never, no one cares about those. Um, I think Chris, uh, I was pretty sure Chris Jericho was saying, for the most part, we don't do those because it's just so been there, done that. The table gets flipped. Everyone knows it's some, something's going to happen with the table and every, you know, and the, just some of the matches were just, the matches ended up being pretty good on TV, but I think it's just right now they're, they're in a weird spot because the end of the year is like, okay, we're doing Wrestle House and we're we're we've got an Impact Plus show that we can't build to on the show, you know. Like the last few, the episodes are building up to Turning Point or whatever. Like they can't build up to Throwback Throwdown. So, granted, they have hard to kill hill to kill to build to, but then you've also got their award shows and the end of the year is just funky. I would imagine it's hard for them to write television. I don't know, but it just last week wasn't strong. And I don't, you know, by promoting a contract signing, I don't think that's like, okay, you know, got to see what happens next week. I don't think anyone really cared. It was a great segment. Don't get me wrong. But the viewership was down, I believe, 77,000. It's the third worse in Access TV history for them, you know. It's troubling. You still want viewers. You know, you still want people watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but you, you never want to see that number go down. Granted, there's people who, there was, people look for the excuses right away. It happens every time. Well, you know, uh, Dancing with the Stars finale was on that night. And, you know, right. <laughs> people are always looking for, they start sc- scrolling. Well, uh, you know, the reunion of freaking, Jersey Shore was on, you know? Yeah. Granted, it was Thursday Night Football. I was mm-hmm. watching Thursday Night Football. The Chargers were playing, so of course I was going to watch it. So, you know. Um, but people people keep looking for these excuses, and I just don't think, of all the wrestling fans I know, not that many seem to be that card, hardcore sports fans. So, right. I don't, I, I don't, I'm, I'm just kind of tired of that excuse. For me, last week wasn't a good show. Mm-hmm. This was a bounce back show. Unfortunately, not that many people, you know, saw it. Yeah. I think a lot of fans are feeling the urgency with these low viewership numbers that are coming out. Now, me personally, um, I don't really put a lot of stock in those viewership numbers because I just don't believe that there's a good and fair and accurate, most importantly, I don't feel like there's an accurate method for collecting these dat- this data. But people love this data. They are... Um, they are used to relying on this data and they react to this data, which is most important, right? Because, um, you know, perception is reality, right? Like if I think you've, you're stealing from me, I'm not going to leave my wallet laying on the table around you. You know what I mean? Like whether you've done it or not. Right. So, right. Um, so perception is reality and people perceive that no one is watching impact wrestling. I don't believe that's true. Like I would say this all the time. Whenever they would do these NXT events, right? And, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, whenever they would do these NXT events and they would have the spot in the show where they show a new debut. It was always somebody from Impact, right? Bobby Roode, EC3, whoever it is. They get a huge ovation. And I'm like, huh, if nobody watches Impact, why is everybody doing that? Why did Matt Hardy and Jeff Hardy come out at WrestleMania in Orlando in a stadium full of people and everyone in the stadium is doing delete, delete, delete. If (laughs) nobody watches Impact Wrestling, 
Make yeah. it make sense. It don't make sense. It don't add up. Okay. It don't add up. So it's not that people don't watch impact. People just don't talk about impact. People don't converse about impact. And I don't care. I will say it till I'm blue in the face. That's impact's fault. You have to do something to make people talk about your stuff. You know what I mean? Like you can't like, like, like uh, BQ, you can't put out a podcast and be upset if people aren't just grabbing it and talking about it, right? You got to work. You got to promote it. You got to get your name out there. You got to make sure people know that the Impact Lounge is the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. <laughs> right? You got to make sure people know that, right? right? So it's on Impact to make sure that you are creating that conversation. This is one thing that Jeff, Dar Jeff Jarrett was excellent at while he was at Impact Wrestling, when he came back for Impact Wrestling for that second time or whatever. He did a great job of getting out ahead of the news cycle in a positive way, right? Mm -hmm. With, you know, match announcements or this or that, just creating positive news because the internet is full of, you know, uh, of, of, of wrestling news coverage, right? People that are just looking for anything to fill articles in their in their websites and i and i do with the air quotes because if you read if you click on half of these articles all it is is you know a a, a wrestling company will put out a tweet and you know this this blog will grab the tweet and say oh blah 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 xyz happened and then link the tweet and then that's their post and i'm like man that is trash like there, there's no work put into this at all so anyway but people are looking for that content. So if you're impact, you have to go out of your way to create that pot, that content that reflects on your company in a positive way. People are looking for stuff to talk about. There's a million and one podcast out there. They're looking for stuff to talk about. If you're impact, you have to go out of your way to create buzz about this. What, one of the things we've been talking about the most that I've been the most excited about the past uh, couple of weeks, they're doing the first ever knockouts uh, uh destination uh, what, what was it called uh ultimate uh, x match ultimate the x. first ever knockouts ultimate x match bro everybody should be talking about this everybody should be talking about this the, uh, especially people that are you know first of all wrestling fans are always looking for something new right and this is a first time thing you know like no you don't have to even you don't have to uh embellish it this is literally a first time thing. And you, you should be putting spotlights up of all the women who are going to be in this match. You should be doing videos, sharing them all, all around about, you know, the history of Ultimate X matches, how dangerous these matches are. You know what I mean? You know how WWE, you, they, they always will say, oh, a uh, Hell in a Cell match will change you forever, mm -hmm. right? Like they stay putting all this stuff out there. Right? They create this aura around these matches. And like it or not, it gets people talking. So if your impact uh, coming up at Hard to Kill, you got a first time ever event. BQ, who have you seen tweet or talk about this outside of Impact Wrestling? No, o outside nothing. of the, the competitors of Impact Wrestling or the Impact Wrestling account, who have you seen tweet or talk about the first ever Knockouts Ultimate X match? No, it's not there. The buzz is, the buzz is with amongst the Impact people. And that, that's it. I haven't seen it outside of that at all. So this should be featured. This should be one of the main, it's one of the main things I'm looking forward to at Hard to Kill. Okay. Like the, the, that. And again, they, um, uh, we'll get into this more later, but they, the, the match that they announced for Deanna Perrazzo versus Mickey James at Hard to Kill. It's a great stipulation and it plays in perfectly to where they are in their feud. And I looked up, I think we were talking about this the other night, and I was saying, yo, low-key, this has been one of the feuds of the year, anywhere, between anybody. But who do you see talking about this outside of Impact Wrestling? And listen, whose fault is that? You tell me, whose fault is it that Impact has good stuff coming up? They got first-time ever things coming up, and nobody outside of Impact is talking about that. Whose fault is that? It is their fault, <laughs> 100%. And it's not because Impact is a smaller company. Because there's some things that NWA has done over this past year that had people talking. Like when, they, when Mickey James came back and they were going to do the all-women's pay-per-view, 
Like that was a talking point. Everybody knew that was happening. Even if you don't watch that company, their their fan base, their viewership, whatever you want to call it, is much smaller than Impact's. Their reach is much, much smaller. But everybody knew that was happening. They the way that they marketed, you know, we're returning to St. Louis to the Chase. And yo, the Chase is a nice ass hotel, man. I I I was like jealous that they were staying there. It's kind of an older structure, but I mean it was it was beautiful and just the ballroom was great, but they sold in the in the whole marketing campaign for that show, the aura of the chase. In the history of the chase. And I started learning about the chase. I mean, even if I didn't want to look it up, it would pop up. It were, there was something there. So smaller companies, there's, there's a couple little things MLW has done that, you know, it, people are somewhat talking about it. So it's not because they're not a smaller, you know, because they're a smaller company. Oh, well, we don't have the, the reach of AEW, whatever it is. It's, it's a great idea. We're super excited for it. But when we're watching the show, there's not... You know, we know which competitors are in the match, but it's like Chelsea Green's one of the competitors and she's, you know, she's doing the Alicia Edwards role of, of I got to be the, the significant other for this feud. So right. how can we get invested in her when it comes to Ultimate X? You, you know what I mean? We haven't seen Tasha right. Steele on, on TV in weeks wrestling. Right. Which is crazy. Bananas. Right. I don't know that Decay has even won a match in, in a while. I don't remember who they wrestled. They wrestled that silly four-way match with right. the inspiration and all that, you know? So, yeah. But, you, dude, I want to say this. So, I was talking to someone because, you know, last week I made a point that the main event was happening and they said that, you know, the following stipulation match is scheduled for one fall. And I'm like... Why don't they tell the crowd a stipulation? And we talked right. about not connecting with the crowd because they don't know what they're watching. They don't know what the stakes are. Right. And someone brought up to me, and this actually makes a lot of sense. They seem to announce everything. And because and, with the knockouts, I also said, why didn't, they, why didn't Gail Kim get in the ring and make a big deal and announce one by one like their music hits and the next girl comes out? Why right. didn't that happen? And then I realized, well, they seem to announce everything in post production, or, or, or they, yep. everything is backstage. And it's, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's because they're trying to avoid spoilers getting out on what the matches are for the pay per view or what, you know what I mean? So, right. I got to commend them for that if that's what they're doing, because they used to, ha I mean, their spoilers used to just fly all over the internet. Yeah. Now I feel like I can watch a show and I don't know what's going to happen ahead of time. Some people still send me spoilers here and there. But uh, you know what? I don't know that that's a great thing because I don't know how much spoilers really in, in 2021. I don't know how much spoilers kill a show. Um, <clears throat> again, if this is uh, if this is 1998 and everything is being presented as though it's live and, you know, it, it, again, like when WWE is giving you a, a, a can show where they're like, yo, like if you gave me the raw results ahead of time, oh, thank you. Thank you. Save me that, that save me that three hours out of my week, right? Tell <laughs> me that, um, you know, Damian Priest is going to face, uh, I don't know, a pencil again. You know what I mean? Tell me that, you know, Charlotte Flair is going to face Tony Storm again, right? Tell me that I'm going to see the same thing that I saw week after week after week. Just tell me and save me my time. But for a hot product, you know what I mean? Like, it, like again, in the TakeOver era, the golden era of NXT, it, spoilers came out all the time and it didn't matter because it was a good, enjoyable show to watch. If you were to tell me, um, hey, on, on Raw Monday night, Big E's going to win the world championship, I'm definitely watching. You know what I mean? If it's something that you want to see, I'm still going to watch. So I don't know that if in 2021 that spoilers have the effect that they had, you know, in 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 the in the 80s or or the 90s. You know what I mean? Because I think that if you if you have something people want to see, they're still going to watch. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like think about when Eddie Edwards won the world title the first time. 
Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to be there live mm -hmm. and experience the actual shock of that. And I'll, I'll never forget that moment. It was great. Right. But those, the spoilers about that, I mean, I, I looked at my phone five minutes after the match was over and it was all over Twitter. Wow. You know, and a lot of people were pissed at the time. They were just like, he's not world champion material. But um, it did generate buzz and people talking. We're getting a little bit off what you were said about Ultimate, Ultimate X and the knockouts, but you know, we're bringing it back to this. There are certain things you can do to get people talking. Right. You can't just announce a great match and then, oh, okay, th this should do it. You, know, there, you do have to go that extra mile. We talked about you know, going all in on the knockouts. I was watching this episode, dude, and even though I liked the episode... I didn't feel like the, the knockouts were, it was like, we we're, I was watching the episode. I was like, dude, when are we going to see some of the knockouts come out? Right. It was like half the episode was over. And then the only ones who we saw on the episode were all people involved in the world title and uh, title matches, which keeps saying that outside of the title matches, it just seems like we don't know how to draw you into this match. We don't know how to come up with a good storyline for it. It just, it's like all the effort goes into the knockouts titles uh, and the, uh, and the knockouts world title as they call it now. Right. So yeah, there, there, there should be more chatter regarding this because this is a extremely knockout heavy pay-per-view with great knockout stipulations, but it's still just being talked about within the, the circle of the impact fan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. But listen, it's up to impact to create this conversation. It's up to impact to create this conversation. And like, you know, again, you have to put this on the company. Like, I, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there's a position that people get paid a lot of money for called social media manager. And that, that person's job is to create, interest in your social media account you know who has an excellent social media manager manager wendy's wendy's yeah. wendy's account tweets about any and everything they jump in any and every kind of conversation and they get their name their brand out there okay like i'm sure you can think of a few more but there are excellent social media managers out there there, there there's customer service people on social media like Social media is where conversations are happening in 2021. And again, it's like impact is non-existent outside of people like me, like you, like the people listening to the show who are already going to check it out. You got to branch out and you got to expand your base. Like, I just, I don't see that. I don't see that. And, you know, you're a marketing expert. So like, so you, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how well has Impact marketed Hard to Kill? Who? So. Negative seven. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put it right in the middle at a five. Okay. Um, the only real, the, the real positive I'm going to give it aside from the matches, which that's not marketing, is the graphics are excellent. Okay. When they pop up on the screen and they're moving and shit, they look great. They're different. No wrestling company's graphics look like that for a pay-per-view. But then this is this is the part where it's clear that you don't have a social media marketing manager in place, like you're saying. You just have someone in the company handling social media or right. handling this and this. Th these are the kind of little things I'm talking about. When they promoted on this episode, the last episode, when they promoted Hard to Kill and they're showing these graphics – and this and this. What's playing in the background? We own the fucking night. Mm. Now it just feels like you're promoting an episode of Impact. Mm. Like, if you want to play that song, play the song when you're talking about the show. And then, and then in January 8th, the hard to kill. That's when your voice, the inflection of your voice and everything has to change right. all of a sudden. As announcers, you got to get excited. And the music has to hit. It's got to be different. It's got to be up-tempo. It's got to be its own theme song. So you're, you're creating its own identity. Right. But, but when it's like you're running down the match card, we own the night. Then you're talking about throwback throwdown. 
again, here's the here's the old school graphic. We own the night in the background. That's not even and how. By the, the song. way, to that to that point, to that point. Sorry, because you're off the cue. But like you 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 used to dabble in music, right? You used to dabble in music, right? And so, like, as an independent artist trying to make it, if you had a dope song that nobody was really, that wasn't really circulating like that, if a company with the reach of, with the global reach of Impact Wrestling, with a network like Access TV came to you and said, hey, we're not going to pay you, but we will market your song, put up a, a, a credit telling everybody where they can find your song on Apple, Spotify, and all of that stuff for this dope song you got. We're not going to pay you, but we believe this will generate interest in your song. We're going to circulate it around the world on our television show that gets worldwide coverage. Would you, as an independent artist, be down for that deal? In a, in a heartbeat. You damn right. So this shit can be done. I'm sorry. This can be done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this can be done. Oh. This is not hard. This is not hard. You know what I mean? Like, this. so, so... Like the, this is, these are just things that, again, like you brought up, um, like you said, they're, 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 when they when they refer to hard to kill, they're playing we on the night over and over and over and over and over. Bro, you can create a deal like that with an independent artist. Just hire somebody. Or again, you know, somebody got mad because we made this we made this comment before. Book an intern. Book somebody who knows what music is. Okay, who knows what music is popular and get them to say, hey, what sounds like the type of hot song that we could circulate promoting this uh, this thing? WWE does it all the time. They're like, yo, the official mm -hmm. song of SummerSlam is blah, blah, blah by Cardi B. Now, they're probably, you know, that's a, that's a that's an artist on a higher level. Right. So there right. may be some money exchange. But again, it, more than anything, it's probably just. The you know more more than more than what somebody would normally pay to license a song from Cardi B is the cross promotion of getting in front of that global WWE audience, right? So again, Impact is in they brag about their international deals all the time. People in internet, and again, this is another thing I, I'm sure you know as an independent artist, people all over the world love American music, love mm -hmm. it. You will put up a song and you will, for some reason, have 20 plays from Africa this month. You know yep. what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's it, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? It, it is what it is. So, so we've, we've gone on a crazy tangent. The whole point here is just to say that there is way, there are ways to freshen up and promote your product. Like, it, it, it can be done. You just got to do it. You got to pay people to do it. And BQ, you've been saying this for the longest time. You said impact is happy just putting on a good wrestling show and they do put on a good wrestling show i enjoy it i'm a big wrestling fan i've been watching it i'm gonna keep watching it all the people listening to this are probably gonna keep watching it or maybe if they're bored by it they just listen to the impact lounge so they can get you know up to speed but they put on a good wrestling show but i don't know if they are if if, if they're interested in growing past just putting on a good wrestling show yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm sure they would love to, you know. And to bring it full circle, here. to bring it full circle, because of those things that we're talking about, the the numbers are starting to bear. You know what I mean? Like, like again, like you said, the Thursday night game was great. Patrick Mahomes versus Justin Herbert. I I usually put the game on in the background while I'm doing work. I'm not gonna lie. I, I have my eyes on that game because I'm a Jets fan and I, I'm used to watching terrible quarterback play. So to watch two quarterbacks out there killing it, slinging it up and down the field, I'm like, wow, this is what the other side feels like, huh? That's nice, yeah. right? So, so that was a matchup to watch. Okay, that's that's fine, but uh, but but it does not absolve it doesn't absolve impact from the steadily declining numbers. And again. I don't know if what was the number seventy thousand something like that. In I don't the know ballpark. An, I don't. I don't. I don't know if that's an accurate number. I don't believe it's an accurate number. But the point is, if the real number is actually two hundred thousand, right? That means that the that that the actual number should be three hundred, four hundred thousand. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. again, whether or not the data method is is accurate, the data collection method is accurate. It's still even if it's a faulty number, that number is getting lower and lower. Okay. The number is getting lower and lower. So 
again, just this, 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 this all comes full circle. The, the whole thing that we're talking about is promoting your product more, just finding different ways to spice it up, putting in a little effort. Okay. Like you, you, getting some, some fresh eyes on the promotion of the product on ways to expand your audience. Okay. Like there's, there's ways to do it. And again, uh, th- there's been a lot of impact fans I've seen, you know, sharing posts because these numbers, the, the, the recent reports, like seeming seemingly, it seems to be a new low every other week here. And, um, and fans are getting concerned. Fans are getting concerned and you can't blame them because it is fair to ask at this point, are they trying? Are they trying to grow or are they happy just saying we have a good wrestling show? And they do. No one can take that away from Impact Wrestling. They have a good wrestling show, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But I think it's more than fair to question, are they trying to grow the product? I'm sure they would love to. I don't think they're sitting at a table be like, yo, we are content with mediocrity. I don't believe that for a second. I I don't think that's how they think. But I think some of the fans are picking up on the fact that they're, it seems like they're throwing their money at the, the talent and the roster, which you should because top of 2021, this roster felt like it had about seven people on it. We were watching the same matches when, I, when I, you know, a few weeks ago, I talked about the, you know, during the pandemic era, I was like, I hated this show. I, I wanted to stop. I wanted to close up shop. Like I really wasn't enjoying it because I was watching the same people every every week fight and every episode was exactly the same and it was just it was boring to me and um you know just my opinion there's some people who who liked it you know and then they would go out on social media say we do empty arena wrestling better than anybody when they clearly weren't and i was feeling like that at the time i was like dude they're just content with with what they have like they're not they're not trying to be better you know but I, I do think they want to be better. I think they any, any company wants to, to grow and, you know, have more viewers and have more audience and have more, more chatter. But I think the focus has just really been on, hey, we're trying to put together the best roster possible, which I do think they have the best one in a long time. But there's other areas that they're just like, I, I really truly think they don't see a, a return on an investment in, okay, let's let's hire a real social media marketer, not... Josh Matthews, you got Twitter this week, you know, and I don't know if that's how they do it. So um, let me not speak like that's fact. My but, gut tells but, me yes, but if if you don't, if you're a company who's selling anything in America on a large scale in 2021, and you don't see the value in having a high quality social media department, like what are you doing? What are you doing? You know what I mean? Like what? what what company is not living on <laughs> yo i would love to see the numbers on how much money popeyes and chick-fil-a made off of what tell me what i'm talking about right now popeyes the, and chick-fil-a the chicken sandwich the fucking chicken sandwich war and where did that chicken sandwich war start on social media on social media like that probably created a record year for those brands, it had to be the profits had to be ridiculous for those brands b- because of just how that whole conversation took off. And I'm sure we can name so many more things. What was that song? Um, oh my God! Remember there was a TikTok of this guy like riding a skateboard and he was um playing this song. Oh, I can't. <laughs> You, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, can't, I, 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 think it's, I think it's like a Fleetwood Mac. I can't, oh my God. I have so t- if anybody, just go ahead and drop in the comments if you know what I'm talking about. There's like a dude riding a skateboard and he's like drinking an ocean spray juice and playing this song in the background. But that song took off like crazy. Mad people were like duplicating the TikTok, like just doing it over and over again. And I'm sure that the streams for this band, I can't think of this song off the top of my head but like i'm sure the streams for this band went through the roof just because that whole little tiktok challenge went viral so again like who in america what company that is selling anything 
is not trying to have a strong presence in social media. So like, again, I, if it's just ways to, that has to be in your budget. You know what I mean? That has to be in your budget. So I, I, you know, I don't know, man. Like again, I. <laughs> oh man, I'm a, I'm available by the way. Okay, in fact, I'm <laughs> available. Uh, hire your boy. Um, you know, cut the check. You can afford me. You can afford but me. But you know, I, you bring up um the chicken sandwich thing. It's just a chicken sandwich. You could you can go to anywhere almost and get a chicken sandwich. But it's like, how do we make people want our chicken sandwich? And I, I like to use for. An example of marketing car insurance mm -hmm. you know whether it's geico progressive you know farmers uh what's the one at chris paul that i fucking hate those commercials dude um um state farm state farm oh my yeah. god those are bad <laughs> they make no sense whatsoever so anyway they're all selling the same thing they're all probably they're all for the most part cost you the same. Like you might save 10, 15 bucks here. You know what yeah. I'm saying? But for the most part, they're all selling you the same shit, but every company has their own way of, of bringing you in. It's not, they're not just like a bunch of companies on the playing field. They say, yo, we got to compete with um, this company here. How are we going to be different than them? They have, they have their own jingles. They have their own slogans. They have their own humor. It just, really, really stands out. It's a, it's, it's, how do I make it special? How do I make it different? And that's just, that's something that's really missing. There's a book, um, a marketing book that is the first marketing book I ever read where I just fell in love with it. And I cannot remember the name of it to save my life. I'm sitting here <laughs> trying to put it over. Um, I, I know it starts with an I and I cannot for the life of me, I'm trying to, um, to scroll through here and I can't find it. But, um, Nipsey Hussle was the one who, in, a, in an interview, put me onto mm -hmm. it. And that's where I like fell in love with marketing one day because you know I was doing music at one point, and and he he said I I found a way to stood out stand out by learning marketing. I was I did, didn't want to just do music. I wanted mm -hmm. to understand that part of the game, mm -hmm. and you know so he's the one to put me onto this book. And in the first chapter, they talk about this restaurant in Philadelphia. I think it was in Philadelphia, but it was selling a Philly cheesesteak. They came out with the first $100 cheesesteak. Mm -hmm. And it was just a cheesesteak. Like, it wasn't like they guaranteed you it was better than the one down the street, nothing like that. They just said, we're, we are releasing a $100 cheesesteak. I think it started off at 20 and then they ended up uh, moving up to 100 or something like that. So they said that that was their, their campaign. Come get our hundred dollar cheesesteak. People were right, lined right. up for this place because it was it was different, and it would, they were challenging people to come spend a hundred dollars on this. Right. You know, it's kind of like, and it became very very popular, and they're very popular for that. And they sold they sold them like hotcakes. And you, you look back at the um, all all in show, right? That was the one that before AEW existed that ROH kind mm -hmm. of funded. Yep. That was, that was like, bet on us. We're going to yeah. do something different. We're going to let you know ahead of time, we want to fill out this 10,000-seat arena, which sounded impossible for a company outside of WWE. Right. But they challenge people, help us meet this huge goal. You know, and I, that's kind of where I'm going with the cheesesteak thing. I challenge you to come buy this $100 thing. It, it's just all you got to do is be different and original and you're going to grab people. It's, it's just, and people are going to be talking. There's going to be buzz. But if it's just, here's social media. We're going to post graphics. We're going we're gonna to promote the match. We're going to promote the show. Like If you can't find a, you, uh, you know, something original, go back to the final deletion. That was the best piece of marketing Impact's ever done when they, were, when they sent the match ahead of time to, mm -hmm. all the, to a bunch of wrestlers and different social media personalities. And they were watching and they were filming yep. themselves watching. I mean, and then you, the viewership comes and it had, you know, 400,000. Right. Um, and, you know, I think they said it was with DVR close to a million. Matt Hardy said it was, it was a million with DVR. Yeah. You know, that's just the difference between 
like having excellent marketing and just just promoting matches and just promoting graphics and be like hey this is what we're doing right you know? so yeah i mean you know listen I, I i i don't know what else we can really say there um you know i what what you guys think uh impact can do to help get the ratings up you know let us know go ahead drop it down in the comments let us know what you think you know impact can do to draw in more fans more people who aren't currently watching impact um you know tell us what you think the impact can do to you know get these rating numbers up because uh fans are starting to get alarmed you know fans are starting to get alarmed uh, like i said i've been seeing fans post about it um you know fans who consider themselves hardcores and um you know i, I don't think they're saying they're going to stop watching but i think that in general um do you think that if fans were to you know hear hear it said that impact is comfortable just kind of being where they are and hoping that they grow organically which is basically to say that they're not like aggressively trying to grow the company do you think that fans would still be interested in the product no matter what there there's a contingent of the fan base that's not going anywhere they're just not it's yeah. when you talk about this viewership being 70 plus thousand, like that's, that's that like core audience. They're, they're not going anywhere and they still make up the majority of the audience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't, I don't know yeah. how much that would, yeah, that would you change. know, I, 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 I agree with you in the sense that it doesn't seem like something that should be a primary concern for fans, but I mean, listen, we've seen that fans are concerned with the business side of wrestling companies. Like, does it take away from watching the product? Is it necessarily related to watch? I mean, God, look at the state impact is in today, right? If fans were only concerned about what's happening on the TV show, the fans would still be here. You know what I mean? But like the, <laughs> the, the day, the day impact died in my opinion, or listen, all credit to, you know, Scott Demore and Don Callis. They've done a phenomenal job of re reviving this product. This product was on life yeah. support. Um, the, 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 the company was literally, you know, held up in court. Um, they had to sue it out of the hands of Billy Corgan. Who knows what would have happened to it had Billy Corgan got it like no disrespect, but Billy Corgan got the NWA and it's not like, it's not like that's thriving. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so, um, I, I, I think that this current re regime regime under Anthem has done about as well as can be expected with mm -hmm. such a damaged brand name. Um, that said, I just, I, I, I think that the day that the tweet came out on TMZ that Spike TV was canceling Impact Wrestling, that was it. That was it. And uh, again, just, you know, people are interested in um, the viability of a wrestling company. You know what I'm saying? Like, it is what it is that we can go back over the years since that tweet has come out and talk about some excellent stuff they've done on this show. But the perception and the conversation has always been that this company is terrible, that they're struggling, that they're about to go out of business. And it's up to the company to change that perception. You can't just be like, like, uh, again, and if anybody, need, I don't know, maybe somebody needs to hear this. So I'm going to say this. If, if at your job, if there's a perception that you don't care about your job, that you got one foot out the door and that you don't really work hard. But if you are just saying, I'm just going to come to work every day and bust my tail and do a good job and everything's going to work out. No, it's not. Okay. That's not how it works. You have to fight your perceptions. You have to fight your negative perceptions. You have to. You can't just, you can't just say, I'm just gonna do my good thing. I'm gonna, you know, keep my mouth shut, put my head down and work. Everything's gonna be okay. It's that's just not how it works. You have to scream it, yell it, show it, tout it, you know, put together data and promote it. You know what I mean? Like, and all these things I'm saying, by the way, I can envision examples of WWE doing all these things. They literally make graphics when they're coming uh in and out of commercial break that pulp that 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 tout stats 
Like they'll you, they'll be coming like Monday Night Raw will be coming back from commercial break, and you'll see a graphic that says Monday Night Raw was more popular on Twitter than um, NASCAR, the NBA, and the NFL this weekend. Yeah, that's you know what right. I mean. Like you you have to put it in people's minds what you want them to think about you. So you can't just sit there and say I'm doing a good job, and you can't just show up and do a good job and just think that people are going to change their minds about you. That's not how it works. It's just not how it works. And that's Mm -hmm. for any avenue, no matter what your job is, no matter what your company is. Again, if, if if you run a business and the word is out that you scam people, you know, let's say, you know, that's not true, but you scam people, uh, but, but the word is out that you scam people, right? Like there's a, there's a, um, there's a, uh, a, a political activist, this guy named Sean King, who, uh, you probably know, you, you probably have seen his name around like the Twitter spaces. And I think he does great work. Like he advocates for, uh, for, 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 for black people who are, you know, in the you, situations where they appear to be getting taken advantage of or on the short end of the stick of the legal system. And I just think that is, I think that's noble work and, and tons of people, you know, pull up his past of his questionable behavior and they just throw that out. You know what I mean? They just throw that out and people are so ready and willing to accept negativity about people, to believe it about people or brands or companies or anything, right? That you have, that's just what people think of when they think of this guy, right? And so again, same thing about a wrestling company. If you are impact wrestling and you know that the perception is they're going out of business. Nobody wants to work there. They're on a network nobody can find. Yeah, um, um, They're broke. Whatever it is. You know that all these negative perceptions up there, no fans like it. If you know these things are out there and if you don't know these things are out there, then your head is in the sand and like, how could you not? Right, (laughs) how could you not? Um, So if you're not actively fighting those things, then you can't expect them to change. You know what I mean? Like, Like, you know, stop me when I tell a lie. You know what I mean? Tell me, <laughs> stop me when I say something that's, that's not true. Like that, that is the, the, and, and, and I will say it until I'm blue in the face. The number one problem with impact wrestling is not the ratings. The number one problem with impact wrestling is their perception. It's their damaged brand name damaged from all the years of, you know, TNA and all of this stuff and all the things that go along with it. I don't think as far as an on-screen product, I don't think TNA ever did anything worse than anything WWE's done. WWE has done tons of horrible, bad (laughs) storylines that go nowhere, like all the time. But TNA slash Impact has never done anything to really win the fans back, the casuals who hold those things against them. They've never done anything to win those fans back. And again, That's not about just saying, oh, we put on this amazing match with Josh Alexander and TJP. Forget about all that old stuff. It's not that simple. Bro, you got to you got to promote that match like it's the greatest thing that ever happened. WWE literally promoted a match between Randy Orton and Edge and called it the greatest wrestling match ever. They literally did that. And everybody was like, yo, there's no way in hell this is going to be the greatest wrestling match ever. But I got to see it just to see what's it. Hundred dollar cheesesteak. Yo. Exactly. So again, mm-hmm. if you wonder if, if you're frustrated about impact and their ratings dipping down, there's your answer. That's where everything, it all comes back to the marketing, bro. It all comes back to the way the company is, is being marketed to the way people perceive the company. And again, impact is the one who allows that they allow it to be so, so, you know, it, when they change that, it'll change. And when they don't, it won't. Yeah, I want to beat a dead horse. So I know we kind of talk about this stuff quite a bit. So we'll, uh, we'll get into this episode, but yeah. All right. So let's get into (laughs) this week's episode of impact wrestling. This was a strong episode of impact, man. This was a strong episode of impact. I got to say, especially when we get towards the stuff we did at the end here. um, This was this this was a good one. So let's get into it. Um, We started off with Josh Alexander versus Rohit Raju. So let's see. With Hard to Kill Fast approaching on January 8th, walking weapon Josh Alexander made a statement 
ahead of his colossal confrontation with Jonah. Alexander overcame injured ribs from Jonah's brutal attack at Turning Point and interference from Raj Singh at ringside to pick up a decisive victory over the ever-conniving Rohit Raju. Uh, let's see, next. Gia Miller, and, and BQ, I'm just going to roll through here. If you, if, if there's something about here that really jumps out that you want to talk about, just jump in, all right? Well, I'll just say about this match here. Um, I was glad to see that Rohit actually got the opportunity to respond to avenge his, 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 him getting beat down last. So the match, I was actually looking forward to the Rohit and Larry Lawrence D match last week because we were getting to see Larry D back on TV, kind of a new gimmick. You know, they had a whole angle, backstage angle to build up to it. And then Impact let us know, hey, this match means nothing. This is where someone comes and interrupts the match. And whenever they do that, it's because the match in the ring means nothing. They're telling you it means nothing. Uh, they're not going to interrupt a title match or something like that to do it or the main event. They do it a match that they're telling us is bullshit. And I was glad that he actually had the opportunity to to come back and, and try to avenge that, that. Because just a few months ago, Sammy Callahan took a bat to OBE and not one of them, the next episode, try to get revenge on him. Not not one. Right. They didn't mm-hmm. even bring his name up again. Right. You know, you know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's a small detail, but I was glad that they, you know, that they did that. But great match. Great opener. Um, yes. So let's see. Gia Miller interviewed Violent by Design and the Good Brothers to inquire about a potential alliance in the tag team division. The Good Brothers explain that while they don't trust Violent by Design, they plan to keep their friends close and their enemies closer. So Doc Gallows and Joe Doring plan to show the world what violence is all about. Moose interrupted an interview uh, with Chelsea Green and Gia Miller, and she, uh, she was talking about you know the historic knockouts Ultimate X match, and Moose wishes her good luck And he offers a stark warning about Matt Cardona's future after Hard to Kill. He said something like, uh, you guys are getting married and this is going to be the shortest marriage ever, even by wrestling standards. I thought that was a good line. Um, (laughs) Then we got Joe Doring and Doc Gallows versus Rich Swan and Willie Mack. Um, Hold on. Was this an eight-man tag team? Uh, No, so with this... Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so, it was, so go ahead. Yeah, it was Joe Doring and Luke Gallows, Doc Gallows. And then I believe Carl Anderson and Violent by Design were there. And then the uh, Rich Swan and Willie Mack had Rhino and Heath in their corner. So, in the graphic, it had Rich Swan and Willie Mack with uh, Rhino and Heath. Right. And then mm-hmm. it just had Doc and uh, Joe Doring on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, Swan and Willie attempt to use their speed and striking skills to overcome the monstrous duo of Gallows and Doring. By the way, I can tell somebody different is writing the Impact Review this week. Um, Swan and <laughs> Willie attempt to use their speed and striking skills to overcome the monstrous duo of Gallows and Doring, but the size and strength of Doc and Doring is too much to handle as they defeat Willie Mack with a double choke slam. What do you think of this match here? So the double choke slam was really boring. I, I talk a lot about the finishes and the, you know, people remember the finish of a match and it's just like the, the, the finishes are just always just standard moves, man. Um, right. I, I thought the match was okay. I just don't care for violent by design or the good brothers, mm-hmm. you know, violent by design. There's some weeks where I'm like, I kind of like what they're doing, but they kind of remind me of, uh, early 2000s Bray Wyatt where you just come out and, and talk about all these things you're going to do and then you don't do any of it. Like it never it never delivers, you know what I mean? You just end up losing. And it's like, after a while, it's kind of like, okay, I don't want to really want to hear from you anymore. Um, but the Good Brothers are just, just not enjoying them on TV. I, right, I'm just right. not. I will say about Rich Swan and Willie Mack, I think this is the one tag team in the division that's not they're not stale. They're, they're not boring. They haven't result resorted to comedy, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's the team. It's one of the teams that I think the people are very legitimately behind when they, when they go out there. And, um, 
you know, Rich Swan's charisma goes a long way because Willie Mack doesn't have that, mm-hmm. you know, but he's done a good job of integrating him, himself into Rich Swan's gimmick and everything. You know, they come out dressed the same, dressed like a tag team. Yep. You know, uh, I wish they would kind of keep the basketball shorts on um, <laughs> and just continue. I just love when tag teams just look the same in a mat. Right, it, right, right. But, um, that's the that's the tag team man that I, I think is uh really should win the belts next. I just yeah. I just think they would be great champions. Rich Swan needs that. Like I kind I brought up last week or week before EC three where you know he was the man for a while and then when he dropped the title, you know there, there's a certain point where it's like okay this guy needs to win again, right? To stay relevant, you know. And mm-hmm. I brought up Bound for Glory against Lashley. I said he needed that win. He lost. And he lost relevancy really quick after that because right. at some point it's like, oh, how many times is someone going to challenge for a title and not win? And then people are like, okay. And right. Rich Swan was just the world champion, was in part of their biggest pay-per-view, biggest match, what had people talking. And then all of a sudden it's just like kind of back down to the mid card. Like we got to mm-hmm. keep him hot, keep him relevant. But right. I, I, I just enjoy Swan and Matt quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Just the other players here, I don't. And this is just a big shit show to let us know there's going to be an eight-way or a four-way tag team match at Hard to Kill. Right. It seems mm-hmm. like, dude, that these are like some serious multi-person matches. They're putting as many people as possible in these matches. But I, it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me if that's what they announced that it's yeah. going to be, you know, four-way, which it, it's just a way they don't want the Good Brothers to lose to anybody. You know, Which is so, so crazy to me. Like, I don't know if the idea here is to build up equity in the Good Brothers so that it means something when somebody beats them, but there's no equity. There's no equity. No. The Good Brothers have spent most of the last year on AEW television, and they just don't. They don't seem invested in Impact. I don't see them as representatives of Impact. Um, I, I just, I, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the big deal was about them coming into impact and they haven't done a whole lot as members of the impact roster to really change that perception on my part. Like, again, I get it. I, I, I understand they had great careers, you know, in new Japan and all of that, but I'm, I'm not saying I think they're bad wrestlers. I think they're, they can definitely go in the ring, but as far as like when this act comes on TV, I don't feel like I have to stop and see what they're going to do. You know what I mean? I don't when they when they get a, a an interview, I don't feel like I have to stop and hear what they're gonna say. So the idea that you know you're putting some equity in the tag titles by keeping them on those guys, I just don't think there's anything there. Uh, but Rich Swan and Willie Mack, you totally could build up to them as like a tag team to carry the division. They're a babyface tag team. They're exciting. Um, like this is what tag team wrestling is all about. High flying, fast paced, interactive. You know what I mean? Rich Swan comes out dancing. He's got good music. Like, yeah. Again, uh, I just, I, I don't know, you know, why you're not like focusing more on building up this tag team. And again, you already invested in Violet by Design last year. Um, you know, you invested in Heath and Rhino, um, whatever. Like, so create a gauntlet for Rich Swan and Willie Mack to run through. And, you know, and, but they should be your tag team champions. Sooner rather than later, you know, because they can go out there and they can deliver matches. Tag teams are not so much about stories. Tag teams are about matches. Tag teams are about like, you know, the fast place, you know, quick switch, you know, cool moves, stuff you haven't seen before. Like tag teams are about the matches. So Rich Swan and Willie Mack should be the champions because if nothing else, they're going to deliver you a good match. So. And, you know, there was this post-match beatdown. And I wrote here in my notes, in case of emergency, break glass and use Eddie Edwards. Mm. What the fuck was that about? I, I understand he has a little bit of a history with, with, with Swan and Mac as, the, as their boy. You know, they teamed together. But it was like, there's clearly an angle going here with all these tag teams. And then random use of Eddie Edwards. And I really feel like over the last two years, with the exception of when Eddie won the championship... It seems like, and this is like face of impact wrestling, it seems like every pay-per-view rolls around and they don't have something for him to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
how is he in a call your shot gauntlet twice? I mean, come on, dude. You know, that's uh, mainly mid Carters in that match. And right. it just seems like every pay-per-view it's like, what the hell, what's Eddie going to do? Right. He has, he has, he has nobody. And it, now we co- hard to kills coming. I have no clue what they're going to, what kind of match he's going to be involved in. I, I mean, is he going to be involved in this freaking, I mean, there's already four teams involved here. So right. I don't understand. It was really weird. It was just random. I mean, it was realistic because someone came to save him. Like mm-hmm. they don't do that enough in wrestling. Like they have friends in the back. And if you're getting beat down, you would think someone always going to come save you. So right, right. it was realistic in that sense that he came to save his friends, but it was just from a wrestling storyline standpoint. I'm like, what, what was this? It was like right, the, right. you know, use Eddie, uh, use Tommy dreamer in case of emergency. Like that's, it's like Eddie felt, you know, felt Oh no. That. How long ago did I say we're watching Eddie Edwards become Tommy dreamer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the kendo stick and everything, dude. Like, Oh man. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, Hey, Tommy's good. Um, <laughs> um, But I was going to say, I do feel like I know where this is going. And for those of you that are Impact Insiders, you've seen that there's a match circulating online of a reunion between a certain tag team. And uh, I think that could be where this is going. I think Eddie Edwards and Davey Richards are going to reunite and come have a little run as the Wolves. I hope so. That'd be great. But he is date and uh, yeah, Davey is with MLW. Mm-hmm. So, but um, Do you know, MLW, that's like an exclusive deal. He can't wrestle anywhere else. Um, we don't know. Right now, M- MLW is not. They're basically saying, "Hey, we're open to open for business. Mm-hmm. We're going to work with whoever." You know, I think they want to create their own forbidden door in a in, in a sense. Because they were on the outside looking in with that. There was a couple companies on the outside looking in. They were one of them. So I think they want to create their own, you know, create their own forbidden door, if you will. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there hasn't been some dialogue between the companies. But if they do that, that would be huge. Yeah. Let yeah, me talk that... about that for a sec. Oh, no. Yeah. No, 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 no. So <laughs> we, we're talking about social media management and everything. Mm-hmm. They put out this Wolves match. And if you look at all the comments on the tweets or the people repeating, retweeting, there, so many people were making the comments, wow, they just threw that out there. Like, oh, hey, the Wolves are wrestling. I, granted, I know it's some independent match. I have to watch it still. It, it probably looks like crap. You know, it's not in an impact ring. But you can... Hey, we got a big match announcement in four hours or something. You know, Tony Khan does that shit all the time. Come back at 11 p.m. Eastern or 11 a.m. Eastern, you know, big announcement. You don't just, oh, hey, here's the Wolves. Like, you can right. only do that once. You can only, you, you can only reunite them one time, mm-hmm. and, and that was it. So if they were to do that, that would be awesome. But it was just so funny that they have this match come out. Yes, it's an independent match. No... I'm not saying promote it as a big match because it's not because, you know, like I said, it probably looked like crap, but something, something, Hey, tomorrow we got a digital media exclusive that you're going to want to see, you mm-hmm. know, something that was just right. crazy. It's just, Hey, here we go. Yeah. Wolves. Yeah. And when I saw that come up, honestly, my first thought of, uh, about seeing that Wolves reunion, I was like, how does impact let this happen? I, I mean, like, I, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Like, I mean, you can't, you listen, Davey uh, Richards is, he, he's, he's contracted by MLW. So they, you know, they, they, they got video of a match to happen on the Indies, whatever. It wasn't necessarily for impact. It wasn't for MLW, but again, if you're impact, how do you let that happen? Like, how do you, yeah. how do you let, a Wolves reunion take place and then you kind of promote it after the fact, like wh- why would, why wouldn't you get that on your television? I just, I, I don't understand. <laughs> Am I the one that's not making sense here? Is it me? <laughs> Is it me? Am, am I the one that's not making sense? I, I just, I, I don't. And there could be language in the contracts or whatever that we don't understand. Like, 
David Richards cannot appear on an Impact show because he's contracted at MLW, something along those lines. I know that, yeah. the, you know, people always say, how did Brian Pillman get with AEW when he was still contracted to MLW? How did MJF get on AEW? And it's because, you know, it became public that MJ, the, the, uh, MJF, MLW, the wording in the contracts was like, you cannot appear on Impact Wrestling, on WWE, on NXT. And AEW didn't exist at the time of those contracts. So that's why those wrestlers ended up on the show because they weren't, it wasn't part of the contract. Uh, the contract listed all the other wrestling companies at the time. So if the contracts now are anything like that, then maybe it's just not something they can, he can do without the permission of MLW to, to appear in a, an official fashion. It's different. if He's wrestling an independent match. Impact has the right to show that because one of their guys is in the match. Right. So, you know, there's probably some some wording in there with a the contract or whatever. But again, there's still there's still a way that you can even if the match looks like crap, I heard it's kind of chopped up too, like it's not the match, you know, but you can still polish up a turd somewhat, you know what I mean? Right. And and make it, you know. Yeah. All right. Let's get back to the show here. All right. Yeah. So um you mentioned the post match beat down. Then uh, Heath and Rhino jumped in, blah, 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 blah. All right, uh, VSK and Zicky Dice were backstage. I thought this was funny. Uh, VSK wanted to inform <laughs> Brian Myers of the Learning Tree's latest loss to Finjuice, but Zicky Dice proposes a match against Decay to get the Learning Tree back on track. Um, I thought this was really funny. There was one part where uh, VSK says to Zicky Dice, he's like, um, uh, no, no, Zicky Dice says to him, look, I'm not going to drink anymore before that match. And then after VSK walks away, he says, I'm not going to drink any less. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so then we got a little promo by Jonah uh, explaining how he's going to beat Joshua Alexander until he respects the top dog at hard to kill. Uh, I like this. I like yeah. this. Just Jonah walking in the back hall. You know what I mean? just talking that bad man talk. And I liked it. You know, Jonah has one up on Josh Alexander. Um, you know, he, he smoked him the last time they got together. So this is good stuff. This is the type of stuff that we like to see um, make Josh Alexander's opponent feel like a big, big deal. And again, like, you know, I think the strategy here is just keep lining them up. So Josh Alexander can knock them down to make him feel like a big deal. And ideally what you want is by the time you get to whatever pay-per-view is going to be, probably slam anniversary. Then you've got Josh Alexander and Moose and they have mowed through the entire roster. And now it's just them standing there looking at each other. So, um, so yeah, so let the mowing begin. It was good. It was very engaging. It was, it was different. And I, what I wrote down here is that the people who come from the performance center, there's a clear, we know how to deliver a promo in an engaging way. Like there, there's, there's a little more polish to them. Uh, not everybody. I mean, Rachel Ellering cut a promo one time and they haven't let her speak since um, <laughs> you know, with a microphone. I'm saying not in a backstage mm. segment, but uh, so it's, it, it's not for everybody. And I love Rachel Ellering. Don't get me wrong, but this was so good and it was so polished and just, it, it grabbed you and you were listening to every word. And he wasn't standing back there with a microphone. I've, I've always felt like once you put a microphone in someone in someone's face, you start to take their aura away a little bit. And if they have a microphone in their hand, then it's really gone. The examples, examples I always use were the backstage segments with the shield, how, how good those were. And then once they started putting them in the ring to kick off the show with microphones, they, you lose all that. Uh, and, and, you know, Broken Matt Hardy was another one. A lot of really good backstage stuff. And all of a sudden, he started kicking off the show with a microphone. And and you just lose it. And, you know, every time you're just interviewing someone, they just become another wrestler on the roster, in my opinion. So, you know, I'm glad they didn't have Gia Miller with, you know, I'm here with, uh, you know, Jonah. And then he's standing there, finger up his ass, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> so... It was good. Like, it's on his terms. You know, they don't do that. Like, Macklin does a lot of great backstage stuff. They don't, you know, we got Gina Hugh Miller standing by with Steve Macklin. You know, like, it doesn't, there's some guys who, who can really create a great aura and, and about themselves 
when they do these kind of segments. And this was just good. It yeah. Made you care about the match. Yeah. I hope they yeah. circulate it on, on social media. You hope. Because there's people I mean, they're trying to make Josh Alexander a thing, but people who don't watch Impact don't know who he is. Like, but they know who Jonah is. So I really hope that they have this clip uh, circulating. Not the YouTube link, but just actually upload the video to Twitter, to Facebook. I, I really hope they did that. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they basically tweet out every segment of the show. You know? So, like, if I'm not watching live, I try to avoid it because I know you think it's going to tweet, you know, the whole show. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, let's see. Where are we at here? All right, so Trey Miguel defeated John Schuyler uh, pretty swiftly with a Meteora. Um, then Trey gets bound and gagged backstage by Macklin, and Macklin's, like, taunting him. And I'm like, this is very weird, very, very weird. Macklin's your boy. How would you feel about this? First of all, is the Meteora supposed to hurt? That's, uh, like, the I... biggest pillow finisher. Um. Yeah, well, listen, I uh, Sasha Banks is a big Meteora person, and <laughs> – Never mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I yes, it, I, it's supposed to look like knees to the face. I think that's how it's supposed to look. Mm. So um, yeah, I guess it's supposed to hurt. Uh, it I looks feel like, like it hurts side... the knees of the person doing it. That's what it looks. Yeah, like. it, yeah, yeah. Like John Siler, Schuyler sold it like he was out cold. I think uh, Seidel was the first one to do it as, as uh, Evan Bourne. And I remember thinking, "Wow, that's that's very innovative." But I never thought it was a finish. Um, First of all, I want to say, Jux, John Schuyler got half a jobber entrance. You know, I hate jobber entrances. He got half an entrance. You know, like, they didn't announce him coming down, nothing like that. Um, I was told that this match was promoted on social media as if John Schuyler won, he would be the number, you know, get an X Division title shot. If that's the case, they certainly didn't paint that picture on the show. Yeah. And I don't know why he would. He just lost to a female a couple of weeks ago. So I don't know why he'd have a, you know, an eliminator, eliminator match, so to speak. But the bat stage thing with Macklin, what I felt was like, we, we, it's very few and far in between that we get storylines in the X division that, that are engaging. Like it's, I'm using that word again, but usually they just kind of rely on the wrestling. Mm-hmm. And with this, with Macklin, you can't just do that. You can't just be like, hey, he's going to go out there and have an X Division match. Like, it, that's just his character needs more than that. And I just felt like this was different. I mean, I, like, he kidnapped him and bound and gagged him. I mean, that was just really caught me off guard. When he came for the post match beatdown, you know, I wrote down in my notes, I could have bet money that he was going to come out and beat him after the match. Like, I, I just knew that this was a bullshit match because we got the half a jobber entrance it was a quick match i was like someone's coming down after this anytime you have a match that quick someone's coming down and um at first i was just like here we go and then it got really interesting so mm. i'm uh i'm into this yeah yeah so um yeah i mean i trey needs to beat this dude and send him away <clears throat> back to <laughs> Back to 80s Jobberland where he belongs. <laughs> well. Uh, yeah. I don't know, man. I, listen, he just looks like somebody that would just be in the ring with no interest music on WCW. I don't know. <laughs> no, he just, oh, God. I just don't see a lot to the character, man. I don't know what you want to tell you. All right. So Chris Bay versus Laredo Kid in a must-see, fast-paced, high-flying, state-of-the-art wrestling match. Bullet Club's Chris Bay scored the victory over the mask sensation Laredo Kid with the art of finesse out of nowhere. Uh, did you see this match? What you think of this match? So um, the finish was great. Even though I've talked about the cutter and, you know, it being overused, especially out of nowhere, you know, but the finish was excellent. I don't think I was excited as excited about this match as, as most people were. I thought it, it, it got off to a really slow start. I was expecting something very high paced and I don't feel like we got that. I feel like they were trying to tell a, a story and sometimes you just need that X division style match. You know, Josh Alexander and Rohit had a pretty high fast paced match. They still managed to tell a story too, but it was, it was pretty fast paced. 
I was expecting this one to be a very Ring of Honor, uh, AEW-ish style match. I thought they were just going to be going back and forth and reverses and kicks and flips. And granted, I've never been a super big flippy fan, but this I felt was appropriate for this point in the show and to be different from the other matches that we'd seen so far. So I thought there was, you know, Laredo Kid has been given no character. He's talked once on the show. It was in Spanish. <laughs> and it was because they had a little run-in last week, and then they made this match. There was no... St- Rohit and Josh, you had to tell a little bit of a story because of what happened last week. Like, it wasn't necessary this time to be brawling on the outside and, you know... uh you know, doing rest holds and stuff like that. It just wasn't necessary for me. So I don't think I enjoy this as much as most people did. I mean, D'Lo and Stryker were sitting here going, oh, this is match of the year can- before it started. Match of the year candidate. Uh, Matt Stryker started saying, you're going to remember where you were on Thursday. <laughs> like, like it was September 11th, you know? And uh, like it was a, a Kennedy assassination. Like, you know, where were you the night that, you know, Trump won the election, you know, like I was like, dude, this match was no, for me, I was super excited to watch it. I just don't think it delivered rather, you know, more than the standard X division match that we get. I just expected them to like really, really go at it. Chris Bay needed this win. uh, And I'm glad he, he got it in the fashion that he did because I can't understand having the bullet club on your show and not, making them the hottest part of your show, one of the hottest part of your show, hard, hottest parts of your show, uh, giving them multiple opportunities at the titles and not putting them on them. Like, I can't understand that, dude. I Clearly, I think just the good brothers just have that much of a stranglehold on, on the tag team division. It, it has to be. For you to cool off the Bullet Club is insane. Um, they've been wanting, I'm pretty sure they've been wanting the Bullet Club on their program for years, and now they get it. And it's, it's like they're doing nothing with it. They're just doing a match here that means nothing. But I think probably the majority of the people were more entertained with this than I actually was. And I wanted to say what I, what I noticed at this point in the show in the commentary, uh, you know, I always have my commentary notes, is that Stryker and D'Lo, I've, I've said they sound a lot better ringside and not in post-production, a lot yeah. better. But the problem is, There's not a clear-cut play-by-play announcer and a clear-cut color commentator. They're Mm. both calling the moves sometimes. You know, you hear D'Lo going for the cover, and sometimes Stryker says it at the same time, and then sometimes it's there's silence because they don't know who's supposed to call the moves and who's supposed to provide color. It's just Mm. like they have the same exact role, and they're all over the place because of it. Um and I'm not saying they, you know, they do call moves from time to time. But if you close your eyes and listen to Excalibur, which some people don't like him, I like him a lot. You know exactly what's going on in the ring. Right. Like if you if 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 you were just listening to the audio, he's letting you know the story being told in the ring. You know the moves. You, they know where they are. Striker and D'Lo are are very reactive. It's mm-hmm. a lot of oh, huh. you see that? <laughs> what a maneuver! Yeah, what a maneuver! You, what the hell? Huh, what? A, yeah, what the it's hell? It's a lot of <laughs> right. So it's a lot of that. Um, they're not telling you know they'll be brawling on the outside and you know hit him into the pole and it's just like oh, there's times where they go for the pin and they're just like they don't say anything. It yeah. just yeah. goes for the pin. It just silence and they're like oh, kick that. And that's the way I like to 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 think of it and. Maybe it's because I grew up with Gorilla Monsoon, man. But I feel like I want to close my eyes and you tell me what, you know, what's going on. And I don't get that from it. It's, it's very, sometimes they're both calling the moves at the same time. And then sometimes they're both doing color. And by that, I'm saying having these conversations and, you know, Stryker should be saying, hey, this is what's going on in the match. And then D'Lo provides the color. But it's like, they're both being play by play sometimes. They're both being color. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes they're doing neither. And it's, it's, for me, like super disjointed. But it's way better than it's been. I got to say that. But they're just not, not painting a picture for me. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, all right, so let's see. 
All right, so yeah, Chris Bay and Laredo Kid. All right, so then we look back at Ring of Honor's final battle last Saturday as Deanna Perrazzo challenged reigning Ring of Honor world champion Rock C. Matt Stryker confirms that Impact Management has made the match official and it will take place at Hard to Kill. Mickey James and Deanna Perrazzo, uh, they get into a heated brawl following a confrontation at a contract signing. So let me describe this a little bit better. Um, I like the way this, this was set up. If you've been paying attention to Impact social media, you've seen that they've been doing um, little meet and greets, you know, outside of the venues for like Hard to Kill. And so this set up where uh, Deanna was at a table doing like an autograph signing. And Mickey walks up and she's just like, you know, trash talking her. And of course they start getting into it. Um, and, you know, so, it, so, you know, look, you're embarrassing the company, you know, like you're, you know, we can't have this. And then they fast forward. It's, you know, Scott Demore and Gail Kim, they're sitting down, Deanna and, and, and Mickey, and they basically tell them this is now going to be a Texas death match. And I'm like, dog, this is dope. This makes sense. Okay. This makes sense. If you go back and look at this feud, right? If you go back and look at this feud, Mickey James was putting together the all women's pay-per-view for NWA. She asked Deanna Peraza to be a part of it. Deanna basically dissed her, told her, you know, that she wasn't important. Then, you know, they went, they had a lot of back and forth. Deanna agreed to appear on Mickey's pay-per-view. Then uh, she goes out and attacks Mickey the next night at a different show. Then, you know, they have the, the, the back and forth to get to the match at Bound for Glory. Leading up to that, you know, there's a lot of insults, a lot of stuff going on. Um, Deanna shows up to Mickey's house and beats her down. Um, I mean, like, there was, there was just a lot. Like, this has been a really, really, really great feud. It really has. And Impact has some, you know, I talk about how they, you know, don't do a lot social media-wise. They don't seem to have a good social media manager. They have good production people. They have people who can produce high quality video packages. I need to see some good packaged content about this Mickey and Deanna rivalry. They can make a half hour show out of it. They can do a lot. This has just been a lot of good stuff here, man. There's been a lot of good stuff here. Um, by the way, that's free money I just gave y'all. You know what I mean? Packing nah. all this stuff, all the stuff, all, all the vignettes with, with, with all the matches, man. Like that's some good stuff right there. Um, so it makes sense that this all comes to a head in a Texas death match at Hard to Kill. It makes sense. This is like a blood feud. Um, Mickey James emphasized when she was first coming back that no, you're not getting the Mickey James that you've seen the past few years, which is basically referencing who she was on WWE TV. She was like, no, you're getting hardcore country. She made, she made it a point to let you know that this person she was going to be with somebody different than what you're used to seeing because Deanna brought that out of her. And then she beat Deanna, took her title, and what did Deanna do? Then she changed. She came, and again, she's, you know, talking about going back to being like the master of the Fujiwara armbar, like, you know, just basically getting down and dirty. She changed her outfit. You know, she's a lot more, a lot more gutter with it now. She's a lot more, you know, like she, she's taking it the street fighting style. And you love it. You love to see it. Like, Deanna Perrazzo is an excellent professional wrestler. Like, again, little stuff like that, like tweaking your character, like you can get behind it because this adds the extra, the extra spice to that third match or second match. This, this adds another tweak to it where you're like, okay, why is this different? This is different now because now Deanna's changed her character to try and raise her level up to, to get her title back from Mickey James. And so... Again, a Texas death match, basically a last man standing match, anything goes, last woman standing match, anything goes. And, um, you know, I don't know, man. I, just, I think it's dope. The stipulation makes sense at this point in the feud. And this is just good stuff all around, no matter how you slice it. It's, it's not boring. It's not repetitive. It's not like this is the same thing we've seen rinse and repeat. Like this progression, the way this feud is progressing makes perfect sense. This was super good. It was super different. And um, 
you know, a couple of weeks ago I had said, yo, I hope that they're not just resorting back to just brawling every week because the, the build they did for Bound for Glory was excellent. I mean, holy shit, perfect. And then they just started having, you know, they're having mixed tag matches and they're fighting every week. One of the problems with Hard to Kill is that everyone keeps getting their hands on each other to where I think a, a pay-per-view, you keep your, you know, like CM Punk and MJF. They've had all, multiple in during segments. They're not, they haven't touched a single time, you know? And there's been impact pay-per-views, especially under Dixie towards the end. I thought, you know, her and Corrigan did actually a pretty good job of having pay-per-views where they kept, um, you know, they kept Lashley and Drew McIntyre away from each other. There was a paper, you know, pay-per-view, I guess, I think it was under Anthem. They kept Moose and Austin Aries away from each other. And there's even just matches throughout the card. Like, they weren't, it was hard to kill. Everyone's touching each other. Everyone's, everyone's going at it at, at every week. Everyone's brawling. And, and um, that was my problem with this. I was like, fuck, man, that's, that's what we're getting now. But it was part of the story that, you know, that led to the Texas death match. So then I feel like a fool. I was like, oh, they knew exactly what they're doing here. I'm, I'm sitting here overanalyzing it. So, you know, man, bravo to them. The, when they said it was going to be a Texas death match, at first I was like, they're going to say it's a no, you know, hardcore rules match, no DQ. It's a Texas death match. It's probably going to be a hardcore match. Like I, ha- I doubt it's going to be a real Texas death match. It might be. Who knows? But if it is, it's going to get people talking like we were just talking about. Um, if, they, if they really go all out with this. If it's just, you know, there's trash can lids and wet floor signs and stop signs and, you know, staple guns. Uh, you know, the thumbtacks, those those normal spots that we get in a Tommy Dreamer match, then no one's going to be talking about it after. But if they they really go all, all out with this, it, people are going to be talking. absolutely freaking lutely But perfect, you know, lead up to this. Yeah. So we got a teaser telling us that Masha Slamovich is coming. Do you care? Yeah, actually, uh, she's, she's pretty good. I... I I, I'm struggling to see how they're going to incorporate her into the division, but you know she's pretty good, so okay. down for it. <laughs> All right, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, we got Tanil Dashwood versus Jesse McKay. The passive aggressive relationship between the influence and the inspiration continues to explode as Caleb with a K pull the referee out of the ring just as Jesse was about to score the win. The confusion at ringside allowed Tanil to connect with the spotlight kick to pick up the win. Tanil Dashwood with the win over Jesse McKay. Um, this match was more competitive than it should have been. Uh, Jesse McKay, not <laughs> known was. for her wrestling, okay? Not quite known for her wrestling. Um, but Tanil's really good, man. Tanil is really good. I don't know for what reason she's never been quite heated up as like a, a knock a main eventer for the knockouts. But um, I just, I, I don't know. I just, you know, I, I don't know if, if her dedication isn't to that level or if, you know, I don't know if manage, management just doesn't see that in her, but she can be so good when she wants to be, man. She can be so good when she wants to be. I think, I think the problem was they, they try to heat her up immediately and she was a baby face. Tennille's never been good as a baby face. It don't matter what company you, you're you talking about. She She's just not. You didn't like the, the, heel, with the bubbles? Yeah, even though I did like her, I did like her at the time for my own personal taste. As far as just a, a baby face run, like that's just never been her thing. Right. And right. as a heel, she's perfect, and she's... I find I find her funny. I think there's some people that don't see her as very charismatic or funny. I think she's effing hilarious personally. Um, I hate her theme song. I hate it. And every time the influence comes out and it just says Tennille Dashwood, it's all about me. I will never understand why they don't have a team theme song or a team video. Uh, I, I don't understand that. But I, I think she's she's really good when she wants to be. You know, she's still, no matter how you want to flip it, uh, no matter how you want to slice it, she's still part of some of the best women's matches in the WWE library. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're talking about the page match, 
the um the Oscar match, you know, like she, she's she's very capable. And you're right. This went on a lot longer than it needed to. I posted on Twitter, did Tennille write the fight the wrong member of the influence? I mean, uh, uh, inspiration. And people right. people thought I was asking like something very deep and I actually just thought that she was wrestling the wrong girl. Like I thought they were promoting it against the, the other one, yeah. um, against Cassie. But it, the problem is Jesse's picture. She looks like Cassie in the graphic. So that's why I was, I was confused, but I, <laughs> people thought I was like, well, she is, should she be right fighting the other person? You know, what's going on here? So, uh, you know, um, but this, this went on pretty long, dude. And, uh, I thought it was oh, super uh, rushed. I mean, the fact that these two are going at it. I mean, so they're they're like your friends for years, and then a week later, because of a you know a little bit of a misunderstanding during a comedy match, like all of a sudden they're bitter rivals. You know, Get the hell out of here. But yeah, what were you gonna say? I don't even know. Uh, less said about this, the better. <laughs> All right. so let's see here we had the main the show was made event by contract shot signing scott demore presided over contract signing between moose w morrissey and matt cardona for the impact world championship match at hard to kill w morrissey declared that he came to impact to become world champion and he plans to do that at hard to kill he signs the contract and then he leaves so then matt cardonia accompanied accompanied by chelsea green who by the way I just want to say Chelsea Green the last two weeks has been, um, I don't know if she caught a sale on cat suits, but she had on a leopard print cat suit last week. <laughs> she had on the all leather joint this week. And lady, lady, <laughs> let me just tell you, I think the young ladies call it serving. She was serving. Okay. <laughs> now, I mean, I just, I just got to give her credit where, where, where credit is due. Cause she just, you know, she's really, she looked really dope. No, she looked really dope. I mean, yeah. um, she's a person who we've seen just do a lot of different looks. And I just thought she was like, you just, you know, she just like, you, you couldn't, you couldn't miss her. You couldn't take your eyes off her. Um, whenever the camera was pointing in her direction, like, just the past two weeks, she just, her looks have just been fire. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not even necessarily like saying that like in like a sexual way. I'm just saying like her looks have been fire. You know what I mean? Like she just really has some, some really dope looks. Like I just, I think the cat suit, the whole look is like, it's just, you know, she's got, she's in amazing shape. You know what I mean? Like it, it really compliments her. Like uh, she looked dope. She looked dope. So just give her her credit. Keep doing your thing. <laughs> and, 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 and after the way this, um after the way that this segment ended, okay. Uh, listen, if you, if you want to put Matt Cardona in the doghouse, you know, the impact lounge, a couple of, <laughs> of uneligible bachelors over here. Okay. Uneligible, not uneligible. bachelors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but is your man doing you wrong? Is your man doing you wrong? Okay. So <laughs> here we go. Uh, so Matt Cardona accompanied by Chelsea Green says that nobody has been counted out more than he has, but his passion is not hard to kill. It's impossible to kill. And then Cardona signs the contract after stating that he will never be more ready than he will be at hard to kill. So then Moose asks Chelsea Green what will happen after he proves that Matt Cardona will always be mid Cardona. Get it? Mid Cardona? Okay. Um, a brawl <laughs> breaks out between Moose and Cardona. And after more trash talk, Moose drives Cardona through a table. By the way, that description did not do justice here. What 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 did Moose say? He said something like, um, after I beat Matt Cardona, are you gonna stay with him or are you gonna leave him like the whore that you are? Yeah, oh my god, like, bro. Whoa, dog. That is that is out of bounds. Throw the flag. Unnecessary reference, brother. That was that was OD. So then Matt Cardona dived over the table like he should have. Okay, like he should have. And uh, and it was on, but you know it didn't work out too well for Matt Cardona. He got choke slammed through a table, and um, then after this, Moose comes back to attack Cardona with a chair. Um, Cardona looked to hit Moose with a chair, but Moose ducked, and Cardona hit Chelsea Green instead. She was laid out in the ring, and Moose was outside the ring laughing his ass off. And a concerned <laughs> Matt Cardona was, you know. They're, you know, uh, looking looking upset and remorseful as the show went off the air. Um, 
So this is a really, really strong end to the show. Uh, I got to ask you, man. I got to ask you. I got to ask you. Uh, they want us to believe that Matt Cardona has a real shot at winning the Impact World Championship. Um, I got to ask, is it working? Do you believe Matt Cardona has a real shot to win the Impact World Championship? I do think he has a shot. I can't imagine they would take the belt off Moose. I, I think... I brought it before. I think there's something... There's something in the works here. I think there's a very possible double turn in the, in place. I think they're going to find a way to keep Cardona and uh and Morrissey very relevant in this after this match, but I don't think it's with Moose. I, I think Moose is going to leave as the champion and have that headline. But I feel like there may maybe a. a a double turn between those two and they're going to, they're going to feud because they're. So Moose is going to be the good guy and Matt Cardona is going to be the bad guy. No, no, no. Cardona and uh, Morrissey. Ah, okay. 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 Um, And ma- maybe I'm fantasy booking too much, but I just, I see that a double turn very potentially coming so that Moose still the champion has that narrative and can move on, you know, in a program with Josh Alexander or, you know, if that if that's what's next, I don't see these two just losing and then going home and then coming back the next episode of Impact as their as their normal gimmicks. Because, you know, they had Morrissey completely leave. It's almost like they want you to forget about him. You know, because Moose is Moose keeps being just focusing on Cardona. He's not he he doesn't have that same focus on Morrissey. So, I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but I, I do think that there's going to be some kind of interesting story to, you know, to come out of this Chelsea green, who I think is great. Her acting was horrible on this. I, I, <laughs> I was, I was, I was almost waiting for her to nut shot Cardona. That's how un. it's like he goes through a table and then she just kind of crawls, crawls over like, well, this is, this is inconvenient. This is <laughs> quite a pickle that we've uh, found ourselves in. Like, I was expecting her, like, dude, Eddie Edwards go through a table, Alicia go, you know, throw herself on him. Like, no, you know, like, she's, like, beside herself, you know. I didn't I didn't get that from Chelsea. And, you know, even at the end where she's like, Moose, you don't know. Like, it just wasn't – it just weird, was, was oddly not believable for someone who I think is a really good performer and actress. And, you know, I, I can't really say anything bad about Chelsea Green. I, I thought it was like the one, just the one thing to this segment that it was it was missing was like more passion on the side of um, on Chelsea. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, it, it it definitely looked the whole time like she was setting up for something, like she was waiting for a cue to do something. Yeah. It, it looked like she was just really, really just waiting on the cue, like getting in position. Like uh, the concern wasn't there as she was getting in position for, you know, the eventual chair shot or whatever. Um, so I definitely see how you can say that. But, I mean, listen, when he hit her with the chair, like, it came off, it popped. It popped, man, like that. It definitely, um, it, uh, it it had its desired effect. I could say that. Yeah. So, um, I, I don't think Matt Cardona is going to win the title. But, man, they want you to think. They want you to think there's a chance. And I saw a tweet today that Matt Cardona is – uh, according to him, wishing GCW the best in their future endeavors. So if he's basically saying we're not working with GCW anymore, is there a reason behind that? Is that because the company he's on TV for is saying, hey, you can't be our champion and be out there doing jobs at GCW. So um, hmm. I wouldn't, I would not put it past Impact to do this. I wouldn't put it past them. Plus, in the time that he was GCW uh, champion, he was working as a heel, and I liked it. And I got, and we talked earlier about things that would get some eyeballs on Impact. Heel Zack Ryder as Impact champion. I'm sorry, heel Matt Cardona as Impact champion. I think people are going to tune in just to check it out. So I think there's something to it. There's definitely something to it. All right. So that was our episode of Impact. We are pretty much... That that's that's the last episode before Hard to Kill. I mean, they're gonna do 
the year in awards this week. And I think they'll probably do a best of the week after. So that's probably it, right? Before Hard to Kill, there's probably not another episode. Another in arena episode. Yeah, there's not. So how do you feel like we are going into Hard to Kill? Do you feel like the setup is good? Like, are you excited for the show? I'm excited for it as an Impact fan because what they are put together match-wise looks like it's going to be really good. But I I still think the 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 build has been really lackluster in the sense that you know, like I said at the top of the show, they're 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 announcing matches and in, in backstage segments, post production. It's probably to avoid spoilers, but it it just it makes everything so anticlimactic climactic the way that they that they put the matches together. It just you know yeah. backstage in a room with Scott Demore, you know, like I just I just wish we just see more with the fans involved to make it more exciting, but. Mm-hmm. It's just such a start, stop, start, stop because you throw this throwback, throw it down on their unnecessary fucking show. Um, and then you have a best, you know, you, you've got a wrestle house in there. You've got these end of the end of year awards that really aren't necessary. They're not. They see, you know, WWF, I can't believe I call them WWF, WWE years ago. So we're going to give out the freaking slammies and impact. Whoever, whoever was running TNA at the time said, yo, WWE did this. Now we got to give out awards. And, you know, you're trying to promote a pay-per-view. I, I just think it's, it's really unnecessary. If you want to do something on social media, and we're going to announce this and this, that, that's fine. Don't do a fucking... We don't need an award show. You know, so... It's just a very stop, start, stop, start, stop type of build to the pay-per-view so that's why i'm like dude it just it's just kind of a weak build but at the same time the matches they have put together they've done a very good job with so i'm excited for it but i'm not uh, i'm not like yeah yeah, no no i i agree i'll totally agree with you i I mean i am i'm i'm excited to see some things on the show i'm excited for the main event which is that's that's great that's a bonus um i am obviously excited for the knockouts uh ultimate x match first time ever which has been criminally under promoted and i'm excited for the mickey james diana perrazzo match um and honestly that's the way it's been for this show right like for just and on a weekend week out basis you know like you know what's the world champion doing what's diana and mickey doing and you know that's kind of like everything else is just like a soup Right, it's just like a soup of stuff, and so um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna watch pay per view. I'm gonna pay for it. Fight TV, you know. I'm 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 gonna watch the show. Um, but I don't know. Like, I wish there was more excitement sprinkled throughout the show. Um, and again, I say this uh, all the time, but I'll say it one more time. I really think it'll be great if Impact were to adopt the takeover model, where at your pay per views. You just give us give us two and a half hours of five bust ass balls to the wall matches. You know, give us give us five matches that were that will that we can't stop talking about, as opposed to ten matches, uh, f- five of which we don't care about. You know, two we're kind of interested in, and three we really want to see. You know, like uh, it's just you don't have to do that. You don't gotta fill a car with matches just to give us matches like give us some great stuff that everyone will love do, do that yeah no, and and just don't just throw people on the pay-per-view just to just to get them involved right i i would imagine because a lot of people are paper appearance that it's a big deal to get on the pay-per-view and maybe there's even a pay-per-view bonus i don't know i don't have a clue i can see why they throw so many people on there you know, it'd be different if everyone was a salary talent and, you know, it's probably a different, completely different story, but it does water down the matches quite a bit. Um, you know, maybe, maybe don't do a Scott Dimore backstage segment and add another match to the episode of Impact if you want to pay someone, you know, but it's, 
it just seems like they're just throwing so many people into the matches. And then I have to believe when they announce the world title and the knockouts title matches, those are just going to be multi-person matches. And then... They haven't... A, hold, they haven't officially... Give me one second. I'm sorry. I'm gonna. I'm, gonna pa- I'm sorry, folks. I have to pause this for one sec. Sorry, folks. I had to step away for a second. But uh, what I did want to say was that um, they, I don't think they've announced an X Division title match yet. We would imagine it's Macklin and Trey Miguel, but you know maybe there's gonna be a stipulation or something like that to this because at this point you can't just have a one-on-one match. Uh, the dude was bound and gagged, so. You know, or maybe maybe he's gonna disappear for hard to kill. Who knows? And and um, I don't know. Maybe they fight I mean, down the line. But. Due to the fact that Trey was uh, you know, like tied and beaten, I would say that's sufficient cause to want a match. That's, <laughs> that's yeah, uh, yeah. I just can't see just a regular one on one match happening. But right, that's true. Uh, right. Well, when was when's the last time they did a regular one on one match for the exhibition title? Right, right. Impossible. All right, so. We promised the people this, so I say it's time that we do, we give it to them. Um, for those of you that don't know, Impact Wrestling has, I think they've closed the voting for their year in awards. If you haven't voted, I don't know if you still can, but if you go search their, um, their social media, they have up uh, the, the link to, uh, to, to vote on the categories. And me and BQ took a look at the list, and we said, hey, not only we could tell you who we think is going to win, we could do that. But rather than just tell you who we think is going to win, I say let's make the case for who we think should win. And what we're going to do, because we're both so good at this, we are going to just pick random people from the category and we are going to tell you why they should win each category. So BQ, are you ready to make the case? I'm ready to make the case. All right, so first up, we got for the Impact Wrestler of the Year. And BQ, I'm going to make a case for Moose. Okay? All right. And I'm going to say the reason why Moose should be the Impact Wrestler of the Year is because Moose went from hot to cold to on fire. Moose came into this year looking like he was bound for glory, no pun intended. He looked. He came into this year looking like he was setting up all the pieces to be the Impact champion. And we thought that maybe he might be the person to get the title off Kenny Omega. And then he went on a crazy losing streak, you know, losing all the big matches to Rich Swan for the TNA belt. And then losing against Kenny Omega. He looked amazing when they had to plug him into that six-man match. I thought Moose was the star of that match when he had to get plugged into that match. And at that point, Moose became somebody that all Impact fans looked at and said, yo, this is the guy we can put up against anybody. And we can say, hey, that's our world champion. Who you got that can go against him, right? And he's gotten his his body into the, the best physical shape that he's ever been in. and. He had arguably the moment of the year by spoiling Josh Alexander's big moment at Bound for Glory and uh, cashing in the Call Your Shot Gauntlet trophy, making that trophy actually mean something for once, and becoming the Impact World Champion. Comes on TV the next week, cuts a promo that had social media talking. BQ Moose is the Impact Wrestler of the Year. All what right. Do you think? Now, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You don't have to just tell me what you think, because I know that was excellent. I want you to make the case for why Kenny Omega should win Impact Wrestler of the Year. All right, Kenny Omega. So, Kenny Omega brought the most amount of eyeballs and buzz to Impact Wrestling that has happened in, in, in years. And Regardless of what someone thinks about the AEW partnership and the way Impact was presented in that, regardless of what you think about the Tony Khan paid ads, when Kenny Omega was going to you know appearing on Impact, he brought 
eyeballs. And, you know, he put the Impact world title. He brought it, he had it on AEW. So you had, you're talking 800,000, 900,000 million people seeing the Impact world title. That hasn't happened in, since, you know, the Russo days where the, you know, when James Storm was winning the world title, we had a couple, a couple million people watching a show. You can never say that at the same time, 800,000 to a million people were staring at the Impact Wrestling world title, let alone it being defended on, uh, I believe it was defended on, the, on Rampage. The first match ever in Rampage history was the Impact world title match. So mm, good point. Um, there was always, I shouldn't say always, for the most part, there was a lot of intrigue when it came to Kenny Omega and what he was doing at Impact. After a while, it got a little bit stale, but he had a star power that the, the show hasn't had in a really long time. And, you know, that's why it should be him. All right. That's a, that's a solid argument. That's a solid argument. Um, but, you know, you guys let us know who you think made the better case. You think Beat You made the better case for Kenny Omega, or do you think TW made the better case for Moose for Impact Wrestler of the Year? And we'll see who actually gets the award on this Thursday. All right, coming up next, we are going to make the case for knockout of the year. Now, BQ, I'm going to give you a layup on this one. I'm going to okay. give you an alley-oop on this one. Make the case for why Deanna Perrazzo should win knockout of the year. Ooh, wow, that is a, that is a tough one. Uh, yeah, Deanna Perrazzo has brought relevance to the knockouts chance. It's always been a fairly relevant title. Let me, let me not say that, but you know, she's made it uh, very important. She's been obsessed with the title. Uh, you, you, she makes you feel like her character has to have it. She's had the best matches in the division and uh, it, it doesn't matter who it was with. She's put on classics. She's uh, established herself as one of the best, if not the best women's wrestler in the world which, I, like I said last week, is crazy to think about given uh, when she first came into the company, you know, white meat, baby face style, you know, a knockouts knockdown. You know, who would have, who would have expected that? She, uh, Mickey James having a one-on-one -on -one match on a pay-per-view, Deanna was the only, only opponent for her. Like, no one else was really, you know, with all due respect, really worthy of having that, uh, you know, being on a card at Bound for Glory against Mickey James. But she's been excellent in her roles, whether it was with uh, Kimberly and, and Susan or whether it was with, you know, Matthew Raywall. She's been excellent in what they've asked her to do. She's tweaked her character to where, you know, she's still a virtuosa, but it's, you know, she doesn't have the belt. So she's not walking around proud and, you know, she's, she's uh, you know, got a real chip on her shoulder. And she showed up to, you know, challenge Roxy to, you uh, basically unify all the, you know, winner take all, all the belts. I mean, that's, that's gotten more buzz than, uh, you know, the, the uh, ultimate X match, you know, her doing that, that was, that was really big. So, you know, she, she just dominated the knockouts division in every way. Uh, but it, the one thing you can't take away from her is that she has, you can take all the best matches of the knockouts in 2021 and you can attach her name to every single one of them. So that's all why right, I got Dion. Right. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a solid argument here. But um, in the words of Jada Kiss, it's good, but it's not enough. Because I'm going <laughs> to tell you why the winner of the knockouts of the year should be the Boricua badass, Tasha Steeles, ladies and gentlemen. The one and only from the Bronx, Tasha Steeles. Because nobody, there is not one knockout, save for Mickey James, who came on to knockouts television with more impact, no pun intended, than Tasha Steeles. Tasha Steeles, like, like everybody, they kind of start her off in like a little bit of a background role, but she absolutely commands the screen every time she's on it whether it's a backstage promo whether it's a tag team match anything anytime she's on the screen tasha Steele's 
commands the screen. She owns the scene. Nobody ever, ever, ever outshines Tasha, Tasha Steels in a match. Tell me, when's the last time we saw a match with Tasha Steels and left that match thinking somebody else looked better than she did? I can't think of one. I can't think of one because she, because again, she's, a, it's the personality. She's the fire. She's the flavor and fire and flavor. Like she, listen, like, uh, um, she, she, she had to swap out in terms of partners, Savannah Evans for Kiara Hogan. Okay. And she hasn't missed a beat. Now, for some reason, she hasn't been on TV for the past few weeks. I don't know what's going on, but when she is on TV, when they give her promos, when they did the knockouts, was it the knockouts knockdown? Mm-hmm. I mean, she owned it. She absolutely owned it. I, she didn't win. Mercedes Martinez won, but Tasha Stills drove that show. Go back and watch the knockouts knockdown show. I think Tasha Stills competed three times, did two or three promos, and every scene she was in was unforgettable. Tasha Stills is... Uh, I don't know if you could call her a rookie of the year, but she certainly deserves to win knockout of the year. Deanna Perrazzo, she's a disgusting, vile heel, okay? Um, nobody likes her. Um, she's mean. She pushes old ladies down, okay? I think she stole little kids' Halloween candy. She's not a nice person, okay? She's not a nice person. We don't like Deanna Perrazzo. And so she should not win knockout of the year. Knockout of the year, she goes to somebody everybody loves, and that is Tasha Steeles. Well, I will say we're going to say she never left the match looking better than her opponent. The, the, the match with Mercedes Martinez could be debated. The knockout's no knockdown match. Event. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next category on the impact end of the year awards is for the men's tag team of the year. Now I'm going to make the case for violent by design as the tag team of the year. And I'm going to tell you why violent by design got those tag team titles by reviving Rhino. Rhino had that call your shot gauntlet trophy. Obviously they wanted to do something with him and Heath. Heath got hurt and was on the shelf, had to figure out something to do. So they do this whole thing where Eric Young is grabbing people and changing their character, you know, wiping their mind, making them a part of Violent by Design. And Violent by Design breathed new life into Rhino, into Diener, into Joe Dorn, who we never heard of before. We know Eric Young is absolutely excellent. And by the way, Eric Young was hurt for most of this year and was still a major part of the Violent by by Design storylines. He still cut all the promos for Violent by Design. He still was was participating in the matches and the angles. Violent by Design was an excellent antagonist to every tag team on the roster. And they were truly evil, truly evil. Like they have no redeeming qualities. There's no way you can look at Violent by Design and cheer for them. And that means (laughs) they are doing great excellent heel work much like the vile disgusting diana perrazzo no redeeming qualities no redeeming qualities nothing to cheer for here okay (laughs) and so violent by design is without question no matter what you say violent by design is the tag team of the year so now i'm gonna need you bq to make the case for why the good brothers are the tag team of the year oh the good brothers all right, so we got to spin uh, spin all this shit into positives, huh? <laughs> so it, it, this doesn't have to do with 2021, but when the Good Brothers came in 2020, uh, that was their biggest buzz signing in a while. Uh, you know, how that's played out now, you know, can be debatable. But they're still the biggest name in the, ta- in the tag team division. They're still two of the biggest names in the company. They are booked in main events. They were part of the Hard to Kill main event. They were the only Impact talent allowed to go over to AEW and be on AEW television. So obviously that company uh, valued them and um, 
you know, they're part of the elite, one of the most, you know, biggest um, factions in wrestling. But just being involved with Kenny Omega, being involved in that hard to kill main event, uh, which is the biggest main event they had had in a long time uh, before they did uh, Swan and uh, Kenny Omega one on one. Uh, their win loss record, um, you know, I, I'm doing my best to spin this one, man, because you know, you know, I don't really care for these guys. Yeah, but their win loss record, you know, they go out there, they win matches, um, and they're they're. They have complete control of Impact Wrestling, so you can't beat that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh, man. All right. All right. All right. All right. Um, It's probably in their contract to win this award. (laughs) That was grudging. All right. So for the (laughs) Knockouts Tag Team of the Year, okay, I'm going to make the case for... Jordan Grace and Rachel Ellering as a tag team of the year. Now I'm going to tell you why Jordan Grace and Rachel Ellering are the knockouts tag team of the year. And the reason why they are the knockouts tag team of the year, they got matching gear. Okay. That's for one. Number two, they teased a breakup and brought it back together. And they're still humming on all cylinders. Okay. And they have that whole new day element where Even when Jordan Grace is off having her own separate title run, Rachel is still a bestie in her pocket. They included jazz in the storyline. And this is the best combination of of a vet working at their peak right now, bringing along someone who is rising in the business. So you look at Jordan Grace and Rachel Ellering and you get a glimpse of the current top of the knockouts division and the future of the knockouts division all in one that's why even though they have yet to oh wait they did they did win the tag team championship i think yep. they won on like their first time teaming together so <laughs> jordan grace and rachel ellering um you know like they they, they once they lost the titles they had a long t- they had a hard time trying to get them back but i still think they're the knockout tag team of the year. That's there you go. All right. And now, BQ, I need you to make the case for this is another layup. Fire and flavor as the knockout tag team of the year. Ooh, fire and flavor. When the knockouts tag team tournament was announced and we knew they were gonna be champions, they were the only option. Everyone was saying this is the the, the best real team. They had amazing on-screen chemistry. Uh, they found a way to always be entertaining. They were two times, two-time knockouts champions. Uh, they ran the division at one point. They were they were the the tag team. You forgot there were even other tag teams in the division, but they were just entertaining. They owned the division. Like you can't say that about. The K is champions. You can't say that about Rachel and Jordan's champions. Can't you know? Maybe you can start saying that about the uh, inspirations. I think they're gonna have these belts for a long time. They they might have a Good Brothers run for all we know. But um, you know, the Fire and Flavor ran the division. They had a tag team name. Uh, you know, the company was just committed to them from the jump. So, Fire and Flavor, two time knockout tag team champions. All right. All right. All right. All right. So now for men's match of the year, I want you to make the case for Rich Swan versus Kenny Omega as the men's match of the year. All right. I'll make the case in the sense that it was the most anticipated uh, main event that they've had an impact in a long time in impact programming, as far as, outside sources i mean outside viewers i should say not sources they had the most pay-per-view buys for it it was mainly because of this match it uh you know they had maro ronaldo on the call we didn't have to listen to no you know no nonsense we didn't have to listen to them you know yes they were on the commentary team we didn't have to listen to them asking stupid questions back and forth you know 
Dilo, what's the capital of China? Striker, the capital <laughs> of China is Japan. You know, um, we didn't have to listen to none of that. We got, to, we, had, we got good commentary. It was presented as a big match. It had great entrances. And granted, Rich Swan possibly got hurt during this match, but he still uh, continued. He still wrestled the entire match and uh, gave us an Impact Wrestling Classic. And it was the biggest match of the year in every way, shape, or form. So it is the match of the year. All right, that's solid. That's that's solid, solid little argument there. All right, I'm going to make the case for a different match that wasn't even on pay-per-view for the Impact match of the year. I'm talking about Josh Alexander versus TJP in the Iron Man match on BTI. Matter of fact, started on BTI, ended on Impact because that's how long they went. Josh Alexander and TJP put on a clinic for anybody who wants to try to do an Iron Man match. If I had an hour to myself to do nothing today, I'd go watch that match right now because that match was amazing. It was nonstop. It was all go. It wasn't the, the, the no selling, you know, marathon of nonsense that you get so often in wrestling. They were working holds. There was submission attempts. I mean, this was a real wrestling match, man. And it was during the no fan shows and the match was so good that it cleared the locker room. It brought everybody out around the ring. They were clapping. They were banging on the ring. It was the first time we had seen an atmosphere like that in Impact Wrestling since the start of the pandemic. It was awesome. That was just the mwah, the chef's kiss, the cherry on the cake for, uh, <laughs> for that match. That match was absolutely excellent. And that was the statement match to announce that Josh Alexander, if you had any doubts of who Impact was grooming to get the title back from AEW, you knew at that moment that it had to be Josh Alexander. And that started him on a run of banger after banger after banger matches that led to him winning the title at Bound for Glory. So the match of the year in Impact was TJP versus Josh Alexander in the Iron Man match. All right. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm choking on my greatness. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so now I'm going to make the case for knockouts match of the year. And I am going to tell you why the, the knockouts match of the year was Fire and Flavor versus Havoc and Rosemary from Hard to Kill. So Hard to Kill is the, the top of the year pay-per-view event. This basically sets the tone for impact for the year. And this match established Fire and Flavor as a force in the Knockouts Tag Team Division. The Knockouts Tag Titles were new, and they needed to be established with good matches and credible champions. And by Fire and Flavor defeating Haz ha uh, Rosemary and Havoc and winning those titles, it told you that this new team that you had not been used to seeing was going to take these titles and do something interesting and something new with them at a time when Impact was searching for something. This was during the era of empty arena shows. And so Impact needed something fresh, something you hadn't seen before. And so Tasha Stills and, 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 and Kiara Hogan, the team of Fire and Flavor, was something that people had not seen before. They were good in the ring. They were fire with the promos. They were doing the funny stuff backstage with Fala Ba. And this match really kicked it all off. So I'm giving match, up, match of the year to Fire and Flavor versus Havoc and Rosemary from Hard to Kill. All right. So now, BQ, I want you to make the case for Knockouts Match of the Year candidate Deanna Perrazzo versus Mickey James from Bound for Glory. Ooh, how can you not have a match of the year without Deanna Perrazzo in it? Uh, she, as I said earlier, if you can take 10 best knockouts matches of the year, whatever, common denominator is Deanna Perrazzo being involved. It had by far the best uh, build and storyline for any kind of knockouts match. 
in the year it main event it wasn't a main event but it was a co-main event of the biggest what they call their biggest pay-per-view of the year in bound for glory uh just the fact that mickey james was involved with it uh, an iconic knockout iconic women's wrestler in general you know multi multiple time champion in the wwe uh it was just you know i don't know that they ever thought they would get mickey james back into an impact ring and they did uh, they made it happen uh, despite not getting along with the NWA too well. And, uh, you know, it seems like they fixed everything with that. But, you know, the match uh, delivered. Uh, it, it it had a build to where people actually really wanted to see it. And even though we knew it was coming, it was kind of telegraphed, you know, we knew in months in advance, okay, they're trying to build, versus, uh, mil- build for Mickey versus uh, Deanna. We knew it was coming. We were excited it did. And, you know, the backstage segments they did, uh, especially the one at the the farm, I believe it was at Mickey's farm, killer. Everything they did was perfect. It was just a perfect build uh, from top to bottom. All right. So that's your case. Uh, BQ made a lot of great cases, a lot of great points. Um, go ahead, drop down in the comments, you know, who, who, who do you think made the better cases? Okay. Do you think BQ made a great case for, you know, for knockouts match of the year, tag team of the year, uh, men's match of the year, men's tag team of the year. Let, let, let us know, let us know what you think of us making the cases. BQ, how'd you like playing uh lawyer today for, for, for this little segment we did here? That was good. It was a little rough because I didn't, they weren't my choices in a lot of cases, right? But, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it was cool. It was fun. But you know what? I, what I've always noticed about some of the, um, the some of the people I've always really admired. And this is kind of why we did this segment. I've always really admired the people who do this art form that we're doing right now. Who I can tell, they don't necessarily think the position that they're taking. They don't necessarily believe the position they're taking. They're just arguing it for the sake of getting people interested. And so that, that was a little exercise in making an argument that's not necessarily your stance. Like people do that in like class all the time. But I thought that was right. fun. That was good. Um, so we're coming up on our end of the year show. And we got a couple of things that we're cooking up for you guys. Stay tuned, stay tuned, stay tuned. Um, as always, drop your comments, leave, leave your name and where you're from and Ask your question or your comment in the, in, the, in the comments below. We respond to as many people as possible. We're probably going to do a mailbag show either next week or the week after. Actually, it's Christmas coming up this week. So uh, for those of you who celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas coming up um, or anything else you might celebrate. And um, But I think we, we do plan on getting you guys a show next week. And, uh, you know, we'll see, even if we got to knock it out before ahead of time and just put it out over the weekend, we're going to get you guys a show. It's probably going to be a mailbag show. Um, or we might do our own year in a ro- year end award. So let's just, let's just, let's, let's see how that goes. But by all means, like I said, drop your comments below. Um, you know, uh, once again, like comment, subscribe, rate, um, it, share this with a friend. Okay. If you know somebody who loves wrestling or hates wrestling, likes our comments, hates our comments, thinks we're brilliant, thinks we're terrible, share it with all of them because we just want to bring more people into the conversation. That is the most important thing. BQ, tell the people where they can find you on social. At BQ Speaks on Twitter and the Impact Lounge on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you can find me at TW Talking About on your social media of choice. You can also follow my podcast page at Talking About Pod. Uh, please go hit me, hit, get, give your boy some subscribers. Okay. Um, follow the podcast page at Talking About Pod. And like I said, you know, the, the best and most important thing you guys can do if you like this, if you like this stuff, not only hit the like button, but also share this, tell a friend to tell a friend. Let's bring more people into the conversation. For BQ, I'm TW. Enjoy your holidays and 